Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome you in the Heart Master Symposium. Uh, it's my great pleasure to participate in this program. My name is Dr. Musa Akbar, and it's my pleasure and honor to chair and moderate the session of today's symposium, the Heart Master. And I have with me uh, two eminent speakers from Kuwait. And uh, uh, before I start, I'll just give you a brief agenda of the program today. This uh, program is sponsored by Servier, and thanks for Servier for sponsoring this program in uh, collaboration with the Kuwait Cardiac Society, and this is CME accredited by, uh, by the, uh, the Kuwait Cardiac Society. And the aim of uh, this program is to share the experience on the best practices in optimizing the anti-anginal and uh, heart failure treatment implementation from the recent guidelines. And our symposium today is focusing on the news and updates in management of angina and the touch upon the recent uh, uh, um, uh, outbreak of the guidelines in the heart failure 2021. Although it's not a complete, the complete guideline will be in European Society of Cardiology in uh, end of August, beginning of September. So I will have the pleasure to give you introductory talk on management uh, of uh, a news and update in management of angina and heart failure. And um, I am the head of cardiology unit in Saba Hospital. Following uh, 10 minutes of introductory slide. I will introduce Dr. Bassam Bulbanat, who will touch upon the news and update on angina management. Dr. Bassam Bulbanat is a consultant cardiologist in Department of Cardiology, Sabah Al Ahmed Cardiac Center in Kuwait, uh, uh, in Amiri Hospital, Kuwait. And followed by uh, Dr. Bassam's talk, then we will introduce Dr. Khaldun Lahmoud in charge of heart failure program in chest disease hospital in Kuwait, who will touch upon the new heart failure guidelines that just released uh, uh, toward the end of June, beginning of July in the practice and how we approach them since we have now uh, quadruple therapy in management of heart failure plus add on therapy. So let me give you an introductory slide on the, uh, on the angina and heart failure. This is my disclosure, and uh, we will touch upon the angina starting from the prevalence. The prevalence of angina is increasing due to aging of population and is about 4 to 5% in developed countries. The angina pectoris is a common symptom of coronary artery disease and affects around 112 million people globally. And in more than half of angina patients, symptoms seriously restrict everyday activities, quality of life, and often lead to premature retirement of patients of working age. Of course, Medical treatment has a fundamental role to improve angina, and there are better therapeutic strategies which are needed for angina because the age and number of patients of, with coronary artery disease are on rise. Some of the unmet needs, the angina is common, but often underappreciated and undertreated. The prevalence of angina is increasing. And that increase is owing due to aging and improved survival after MI. And despite that we have a high rate of revascularization, yet we have high rate of angina after revascularization because of other causes of angina, which is mainly a functional causes of angina. And of course, uh, for that reason, the fundamental role of pharmacological therapy of angina is important. Whatever is the revascularization, either PCI or cabbage. However, the angina is commonly under-recognized by the cardiologist and physician routine clinical practice, and we'll come to that. 
and we'll show you how angina impairs patient's quality of life. And of course, if you have incomplete control, is important signal of inadequate quality of care. This a study done in United States uh, from 19 centers, taking 2,094 patients one month after MI. They give him the questionnaire, Seattle questionnaire for angina, and they report angina one month after MI, about 25% post-MI angina, uh, post-MI, sorry, patient experience angina soon after discharge of about one month, more often monthly angina, followed by weekly angina, followed by daily angina. So in about, so angina occurs in one in four patients soon after MI. And the reason why we have angina after revascularization because there is a multifactorial nature for myocardial ischemia. It started with a structural abnormality. If you have epicardial coronaries are having disease, you revascularize them by PCI or by bypass surgery. But what is important is the functional, this meshwork is the functional causes, what do you call it, the coronary microcirculation. And there are two causes. One of them is either you will have persistent vasospasm or focal or transient vasospasm. And the other physiology or other important cause is the microcirculation dysfunction, physiological dysfunction that the impair flow and the, therefore you will get ischemia and then angina. So in other words, there are three mechanisms for causing angina and ischemia. And therefore, these functional and structural, one structural and two functional, can act simultaneously in the same patient. You can have one, uh, you can have two of them, or the patient can have three of these causes of myocardial ischemia. This is the APPEAR study done on U.S. outpatient cardiology, testing 155 cardiologists and 1,257 outpatient with coronary artery disease, giving them questionnaire, the Seattle questionnaire, and the cardiologists also giving them another score. And then they found from this study that, of course, the questions by the cardiologist is blinded from the patient and vice versa. And it is found from this uh, study that one third of outpatient with coronary artery disease reporting as having angina in a prior month. But what was surprise is that about 43% of these patients angina was under recognized by the cardiologist. They report uh, no angina or the patient reporting angina. So, in other words, the under-recognition of angina is common in our routine clinical practice. And final slides on the angina. This is a cost and quality uh, of life data were collected prospectively from body trial subgroup, 934 patients. And in the y-axis is the quality of life score the dot having angina, the clear circle having no angina, and they were assessed at one and five and 10 years. As you can see, those who are having angina having less quality of life. So those who have angina from this perspective, subgroup from Barry has a significant impact on reduced quality of life and that is limiting the daily activities and functional status. Few words about heart failure, and I will conclude, ladies and gentlemen, from this introductory slide. If we take uh, the heart failure in numbers, the heart failure generate major economic, social, and personal cost. And here are the numbers. Heart failure is the most common cause of hospitalization in patient over the age of 65, and the heart failure imposes a huge economic burden, estimated about 108 billions per annum, 
and her failure involves marked emotional stress, distress, anxiety, and depression. And very important, the work, the travel, the day-to-day -day social activity, leisure activities are limited and difficult by the heart failure patient with a progressive loss of autonomy. If you convert in five year death rates of heart failure compared with the cancers of different type, you will find that in the orange bar, the heart failure is deadlier than the many cancer, including leukemia and colonic rectum cancer. And if you take the numbers of the global problem of number of, fa of hospital readmission in patient with heart failure, you'll find around one out of four, 25% of patients hospitalized with heart failure are again readmitted within 30 days of discharge. And one out of three heart failure patients have not retained to work one year after heart failure hospitalization, the ward cost take about 75% of total heart failure hospitalization cost. And very important, up to 75% of these early readmission may be preventable. And the early readmission are admitted within the vulnerable phase, which is the first three months. This is called the vulnerable phase after discharge with high readmission and high mortality, the upper line circular dot is heart failure death, the circle, uh, sorry, the, uh, the square are sudden death, the triangle are all other cardiac deaths. As you can see, the heart failure death are highest in first 30 days and three months, uh, compared with other modes of the death. And therefore, the early hospitalization after discharge predicts heart failure death as called the vulnerable face of uh, the heart failure patient. By this, ladies and gentlemen, I end up my talk. Thank you for your attention. And now I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bassam Abulbanat, um, consultant cardiologist in uh, uh, Sabah Al Hospital Cardiac Center, where he will give us a talk on the news and update in the management of angina. So I would like to welcome you, Bassam, in this Heart Master Symposium, and I will leave the floor for yours to, uh, to give your talk. Thank you very much, uh, Musa, and I'd like to thank Sylvia for inviting us to be with this great audience uh, tonight. Uh, basically, uh, my talk tonight is uh, gonna go through this uh, outline. So, Initially, we're going to address the main challenges in the differentiation between typical and, untyp and atypical angina symptoms at clinical setup. We're going to talk then about the role of heart rate as an independent risk factor and raise awareness of how important is it to monitor. Then we're going to talk clinically, like once you see those patients, you have to know where is your patient. Then we're going to basically uh, change the gears to talk about the uh, ESC uh, 2019 guidelines. And then from there, I'm going to uh, basically uh, talk to you about the DC fearing of the guidelines so I, and why the guidelines gave the uh, basically specific uh, nominations for certain drugs. Finally, we're going to address the high rate, heart, heart rate and metabolic approach and the management of angina within the context of the personalized medical therapy that is the diamond. So let's start our journey. Um, so the first uh, basically part of my lecture is going to be about the challenges and the differentiation between typical and atypical angina symptoms at the clinical setup. The way I, I thought of doing it is just to go away from the, uh, basically the uh, traditional uh, way of teaching because I think all of you are either internal medicine or cardiology. So then we don't want to talk about very basic stuff. So I thought just to throw some uh, area which is uh, new and we're going to talk about some controversies here. So basically, this is be, uh, repeating what Musa has told you, that symptoms are commonly under-recognized in clinical uh, practice. And in the cadence study, it's very interesting, actually. Um, those are basically patients who have been having monthly angina. And 
80% of the doctors, they believe that those patients who have monthly angina are stable. But the weird thing is that even patients who have weekly angina, 48% of the doctors, they believe that they speci- those patients are stable. And even more, much more weirdly is that even patients with daily angina, 37 of the doctors, they think they are stable. Now, why should we care about angina? Why? Because it's associated and it indicates high-risk patients. It's associated with adverse cardiovascular-related death, non-fatal MI, cardiovascular-related death, non-fatal MI, or stroke, cardiovascular-related death, and MI. And you can see clearly here, if you have angina, you are always to to the right of the, uh, basically, uh, midline, to the right of the one, which means that angina indicates a higher risk with whatever uh, cardiovascular outcome you are thinking of. To make life complicated, I thought to talk to you about this because, again, so we said angina per se is under-recognized by the physicians. And to make life even much more difficult, this is if we're going to add sex to it, you're going to see how, how basically under-representative is the sex is uh, being there in the uh, unstable angina and stable angina. This slide shows you the cardiovascular disease prevalence by six, by sex, basically. You can see clearly that basically ladies have a lower preval- basically prevalence of having a coronary disease or cardiovascular disease below the age of 60. But beyond the age of 60, they catch up with the males. And actually, ab- above the age of 80, they, they basically women have much more cardiovascular disease than men. Um, and if you look at the cardiovascular mortality trends by six in the United States. Look at that, basically. From the year 1990, so over the past two decades, we said that ladies up to the age of 60, they have lower chance of having cardiovascular disease, but the mortality is higher. Why? Because we are not recognizing their symptoms early. They are, if you'd like to say, uh, underrepresented. So we are not doing well in categorizing our angina patients, and we are not doing well in uh, underestimating the severity of angina, specifically in the ladies. Now I'm going to throw this angina paradox term. Typical angina in our language is used to describe the symptoms most common among men. I think that's very well known. I mean, even the lady, the, do- the lady doctors, they do, they do that. Atypical angina is used to describe the symptoms most common among women. But there are no consensus on the atypical angina among studies or guidelines. So we are doing that, but we really don't have a good evidence for it. From now onwards, I'm going to share with you the, the, an excellent work wa- was done by this lady. Her name is Catherine um, Kriotsolis. She's from Harvard. And the CV of this lady is amazing. Uh, basically, she's uh, trained in uh, basically McMaster, Toronto, and then Harvard. She's very interested in the, uh, basically, uh, the coronary artery disease of women. So in this study, what she looked at to see what are the descriptions of the chest pain that basically going to tell you that this is more uh, suggestive of obstructive angina in women versus men. Now, all of those patients had angiographic obstructive disease. Strangely enough, all of those experiences, arm, right arm, left arm, back, shoulder, neck, jaw, throat, they have shared experiences between women and and men. Actually, a lot of those are what we are calling atypical in our definition. And that's what we say the ladies are basically underrepresentative. They are not uh, basically... uh, estimated well with regard to the coronary artery disease. When it comes to the descriptive terms in the chest region, again, chest pain, pressure, tightness, heaviness, not not a sharp pain, burning, no chest pain, soreness, they were shared experiences between women and men. In women, they were more of a description of discomfort, crushing, pressing, and bad ache. Now, what happened then, they looked at the commonest symptoms uh, in both women and men. And when they have found that chest pain sensation or breathing is affected, is basically found equally in both male and females. And again, this is 
the teaching that we are giving to our even sometimes the students, we tell them no, in, in ladies, they present with atypical symptoms, while very clearly here that both sexes, they present most commonly with the most common pains that we are encountering in our clinical practice. The, when it comes to the shoulder, back, neck, and jaw, ladies presented with more symptoms in that notion with, uh, compared to the men. Now, if we're going to go, sorry, if we're going to go now to the, basically the uh, symptoms according to the d- disease status among women, if we're going to look at obstructive versus non-obstructive, again, chest pain and breathing are affected in women equally being having obstructive versus non-obstructive disease. And when it comes to the uh, basically shoulder, back, neck, and jaw pain, which were more common than ladies, those four atypical, if you'd like to say, uh, symptoms were equally present in the obstructive and the non-obstructive disease. Ladies had more of perceived heart arrhythmia, and that was basically more seen in the uh, non-obstructive disease. When it comes to the men, they have the same features, chest pain, sensation, breathing affected, equally obstructive and non-obstructive. So what we thought being atypical is atypical even in the male. And for the males, they had a burning sensation, GI sensation that was more common with obstructive versus non-obstructive. And if they, if the male patient says faint, dizzy, lightheaded, or perceived heart arrhythmia, then this is more of a non-obstructive disease. So what did they come of is that? More of on atypical angina. So we're lost actually. Among all, uh, all comers, atypical symptoms such as pain in the non-chest areas, associated symptoms were higher in women compared with men. Men reported atypical symptoms also, and the overall prevalence of those symptoms was low, less than 25% among women. More importantly, atypical symptoms were not associated with obstructive disease in women or men. So this atypical story is not there. If you're going to go to the European Society of Cardiology, actually, uh, basically, uh, website, you're going to see this thing. It's a HERMS study that's, again, done by Catherine uh, Kiritsolas, and it says goodbye, say goodbye to the typical and atypical angina terminology. This is, again, an area of controversy. I thought just to throw it because that's something in you, be aware, be aware of it. Let's move now to the second part of the talk. We're going to now talk about the role of heart rate as independent risk factor. This basically was, uh, this is basically describing the job done by Kim Fox back in 2007. Clearly, you can, as you're going to see here is that as your resting heart rate goes up, your chance of having non-sudden or sudden MI, but more notably sudden MI goes up. And that's why heart rate is a bad thing. The other thing is that as your heart rate goes up, your overall and cardiovascular mortality goes up as well. Conversely, if you change or if you decrease heart rate, you're going to change the time to myocardial ischemia and you're going to reduce mortality. So it's a two-way sword. If the heart rate goes up, mortality goes up. If you decrease heart rate, mortality goes down. And this is actually is seen in the heart failure uh, literature. And that was, imagine that, that was there from 2007. It's not something new, but we were not that aware of it. And I think Khaldun is gonna talk to you about it more uh, basically importantly. So basically when you come and deal with a patient with a stable coronary artery disease, those are the clinical manifestations. It's a moving target. The patient can basically flip from being having basically a stable angina to non-stable angina. He could have ischemia without angina, ischemia with angina, and then he could have progression of coronary artery disease ending up having heart failure. So it's all a dynamic process. It's not a single thing. Now let's move to the third part of the talk, which is where is my patient? So when you have a patient in the clinic, you have to think, where is my patient? Which is my patient? Now, this is an important concept that I want you to leave the room with. And uh, it's probably more notable with Khaldun in the heart failure. He's going to talk to you you about the horizontal approach of the change in the guidelines with regard to the management. 
But again, even in chronic coronary syndromes, this horizontal approach is there with regard to my patient. Those are six clinical variables that your patient could fill in. Actually, your patient could be this and this, could be one and four, could be four and six, could be one and six, could be one alone, could be six alone. So it's a moving target. Patients with suspected CAD and stable anginal symptoms and or dyspnea. A second clinical presentation, patients with a new onset heart failure or LV systolic dysfunction and suspected CAD. Patients with a stabilized symptoms, less than year and after a ACS following revascularization. Patients more than one year after initial diagnosis or revascularization. Asymptomatic subjects whom CAD is detected at the screening. So you have all of those things, uh, basically Minoka. So your patient can drop in any of those things. That's why it is important to know the comorbidities of those patients. And the core morbid morbidities in those patients are going to dictate how you're going to manage angina in those patients. Because comorbidities would interfere with the diagnostic pathway and management. For example, if you have a patient with chronic renal failure, creatinine is up, you cannot do CT angio, for example. You're going to go with a nuclear. Comorbidities could aggravate angina symptoms and further impair quality of life. An example, anemia or hyperthyroidism may affect the use of treatments, decision to uh, basically proceed to revascularization. For example, beta blockers are contraindicated in asthma or in very severe peripheral vascular disease. Now that's, again, is, it's not that common, but again, it's only in very severe cases. Efficacy and safety of medical interventions in patients with comorbidities is often lacking. And again, there are some interactions between certain drugs and disease status. Now, when it comes to the patient, you have to think which treatment you're going to give him. Is it going to be the standard according to the guidelines? Is your patient having a high heart rate above 80 beats per minute? Is he having a low heart rate below 50 beats per minute? Does he have LV systolic dysfunction or overt heart failure? Is he presenting to you with a low blood pressure? And depending on that, you're going to de de decide what to do. Now we're going to move to the third part of the lecture, which are what are the 2019 European Society of Cardiology Guidelines brewing. <coughs> the goals of the guidelines include two goals, and that's important for you to understand. The first goal is to prevent future cardiovascular events, and that's the most important goal. We are looking to preventing cardiovascular events. And by that, it's for aspirin, clopid, clopidogrel. It's the antiplatelets that they could do that because they improve, basically prevent mortality. Then we're going to have statins followed by ACE inhibitors. And finally, other drugs, beta blockers are recommended, for example, in patients with LV systolic dysfunction or systolic heart failure. Now, this is important because when we're going to talk about later on evabridine and trimetazidine with regard to the uh, basically angina frequency, which one is better? With regard to angina symptoms, do not forget that your first goal is to, pre to prevent cardiovascular events. So maybe they are a bit superior with regard to angina symptom-wise, but cardiovascular events is still, the, those medications are most important. The second goal is the anti-anginal or the anti-ischemic goal, which is what we're going to be talking about. So in patients with a chronic stable angina, pict angina pictoris, the treatment objectives are to reduce angina symptoms and exercise-induced ischemia. Again, we said to prevent cardiovascular events, which we have talked about. Now, there is no universal definition of which drug combination is optimal. Again, this is something in you. We are talking now about a horizontal approach. And for each single patient, you might choose to, to choose maybe one therapy or two medications or triple therapy for angina treatment. And that's the most important thing is that, yes, there is no universal definition, but the guidelines are telling you to use your tools wide, wisely and appropriately depending on your patient characteristics. So the general considerations are as follows per the guidelines. Medical treatment of symptomatic patients requires one or more of for angina or ischemia relief in association with drugs for uh, prevent uh, for event prevention. Again, make sure event prevention. It is recommended to educate patients about the disease risk factors and treatment strategy. 
Timely review of the patient's response to medical therapies is recommended because you might change your, your plan. So again, when we look at the anti-ischemic therapy in CCS, short-acting nitrates are recommended as a class 1B, then followed by the first-line treatment is beta blockers and all or calcium channel blockers to control heart rate and symptoms. If that does not work, then you're going to add either of those treatments. So nicoraldine, bronalazine, evabridine, or trimethidine should be considered as a second-line treatment to reduce angina frequency, improve exercise uh, tolerance in subjects who cannot tolerate, have contraindications to, or whose symptoms are not adequately controlled by beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and long-acting nitrates. That is why, depending on your, on your patient, you might choose one, two, three combinations. And that's what I was talking about, a moving target. Now, remember, in the, 20, 000, in the 2019 guidelines, they're now occupying a 2A class, a 2 class A uh, consideration. Now, there is something new that has happened as well in the 2019 guidelines. In subjects with baseline low heart rate and low BP, Ralonazine or trimetazine may be considered as first-line drug to reduce angina frequency and improve exercise tolerance, and that given a class 2B uh, classification. So now, let's go to our uh, baseline standard uh, patient. So you have the standard therapy, which is beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. And then, as a second line, you're going to add... So if you use the beta, uh, beta blocker, you can add a, child's, a calcium channel or vice versa. Your second line for a standard therapy is going to be add any of the second line treatments, which are basically ranolazine, uh, evabridine, and trimetazidine. For patients who have a high heart rate, again, beta blockers or calcium channels, then you're going to add evabridine. We're going to say why. For low heart rate patients, you're going to add basically either uh, lanozapine or uh, lanozidazine or trimetazidine. For LV systolic dysfunction, obviously, you want to decrease the heart rate, so you're going to add evabridine as your uh, second line step. For patients with low blood pressure, you want to choose something that does not affect the blood pressure, and you can add any of the three, evabridine, ranolazine, or trimetazidine. So those are the major changes in the guidelines between the year 2013 and 2019. So for the second line treatment, uh, trimetazidine may be considered, it was in 2013, now in 2019 is given at class 2A, nicoralidine, ranolazine, evabridine, trimetazidine should be considered as a second line treatment to reduce angina frequency, improve exercise uh, tolerance in subjects who cannot tolerate or have contraindications to, or those symptoms are not adequately controlled by beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and long-acting long nitrates. Class 2B is a new thing. In selected patients, as I mentioned, the combination of beta blockers or a calcium channel blocker and a second-line drugs, ranolazine, nicoralidine, evabridine, or trimetazidine may be considered for the first-line treatment according to the heart rate, BP, and tolerance. Let's move now to the uh, fifth part of our talk, which is desephering the guidelines. So let's start with the uh, trimetazidine. This basically is a, um, a meta-analysis which shows the effect of long-term beta blockers for stable angina. Uh, and you're going to see that beta blockers were almost just exactly on the uh, neutral line, maybe a bit uh, on the left side. So they were a bit better than placebo, not that much different. This is a meta-analysis network which looked at comparing the anti-anginal efficacy of trimetazidine with other non-heart rate reducing anti-anginal agents and with placebo. And in those, trimetazidine was clearly superior with regard to its anti-anginal efficacy. This is basically the cellular level by which trimetazidine works uh, its effect. So it basically um, acts on the free acid uh, oxid oxidation, and by that, it basically renders the cell uh, producing less energy. So it basically rests the cell from using its energy. So it makes the cell more wising in using its uh, molecules 
in the energy. And that's why it's important for angina symptoms. Now, when we, looked, when we look at the trimizidine uh, MR as an effective, uh, is as effective as beta blockers and, and calcium channel monotherapy. So this basically uh, trial showed us that compared to nifedipine and compared to propranolol, the time to onset of angina and time to one millimeter ST segment depression was equal between propranolol and trimizipine. And of course, it was better than placebo. And when it comes to comparison to nifedipine, again, it was as good as nifedipine with regard to the uh, basically uh, time to onset of angina and the, uh, and the uh, number of angina attacks per week. This is the VASCO study, which was comparing trimetazidine versus placebo in patients with angina treated with atenolol. And again, what we have found is that uh, patients who were on the trimetazidine, uh, they had a significant change in the total exercise time, they had better exercise time, and they had a uh, basically an increase in the time to one millimeter ST segment depression, which is, tells you that basically it takes longer time for them to develop angina compared to uh, placebo in this arm. And the most important thing is that when you're gonna use those medications, um, if you can add a medication safely and effectively to polypharmacy, then this medication is gonna help you to use it in different uh, patient populations. So basically, this slide shows you that if we get a, uh, if you're having basically a patient on beta blocker alone, or a patient on beta blocker and calcium channel blocker, uh, beta blocker and nanosepine, and beta blocker plus calcium channel plus the uh, trimizidine. And basically, what you have seen is that after the administration of the uh, the uh, trimizidine, there was a significant decrease in the number of the attacks of angina per week compared to the placebo. Finally, the effect of trimetazidine in patients after acute myocardial infarction, again, has been uh, seen by decreasing mace free survival probability uh, compared to uh, control. So that was about trimetazidine. Then we're gonna, now we're gonna talk about evabradine. So why do patients with angina and elevated heart rate matter? Now we know that Beta, in, beta, in patients treated with beta blocker therapy, heart rate and the use of beta blocker in uh, stable outpatients with coronary disease, 50% of those patients basically uh, do not achieve the target heart rate. They have angina, you are putting them on beta blocker, but they do not achieve the heart rate. That's why they are having more uh, basically angina. Let's look what happened with the evabradine. So in this study, evabradine reduced the heart rate differentially. So how did it do that? For patients who have tachycardia compared to atenolol, uh, basically uh, you have a better uh, change in the heart rate at, at larger heart rates. But when it comes to lower heart rates, you don't change heart rate significantly. That is why you can use it even in patients safely in patients who their heart rate is around 65, but definitely not be below 50. We're going to be talking about the trimetazidine. With evabradine, we have a better perfusion per heart rate beat. So basically, which is important. Why? We said because the, the, the molecule helps the cell in utilizing glucose wisely and with, without major, uh, if you'd like to say, uh, tiredness on the cell. So you have a better myocardial oxygen consumption, which again improves your diastolic function. Moreover, evabradine has shown to provide better improvement of the uh, basically myocardial perfusion per each beat reduction of the heart rate than beta blockers. So compared to beta blockers, the resting heart rate is as good, but when it comes to the coronary flow reserve, Evabradine has had a better coronary perfusion as they have compared to uh, basically uh, bisoprolol following the treatment. Moreover, evabradine increases the coronary flow re reserve already in one week after the treatment initiation. So all of those things put this medication uh, at a uh, front to reduce angina and to help the patients with heart failure. Moreover, 
If abridine increases the diastolic perfusion time, which is important for diastole, by up to 41% due to heart rate reduction. Again, so you're going to see here is that you have reduced the diastolic perfusion time by 41%, and then the cell will have, the, the myocardium will have better time to, to relax. Moreover, uh, it significantly uh, causes angina free versus uh, beta blocker up titration. So you have two options either adding uh, evabradine or up titrating a beta blocker. It's probably better to add evabradine on those patients rather than up titrating. Why? Because you can achieve at four months 50% angina free versus 34% for uh, beta blocker up titration versus adding evabradine if you are using a combination therapy. Moreover, evabradine has fewer adverse events than beta blocker up titration. And the most important ones are hypotension and bradycardia. So again, in bradycardia, it was not significant, but those are the ways they were the more, the main, the more, uh, the more important ones, hypotension, fatigue, and dyspnea. So again, you're going to use this molecule in combination because you're going to have less side effects uh, overall in those patients. And remember, those patients are taking polypharmacy. Evabradine is an optimal antianginal treatment, and you can use it in a lot of the patients. That's what we talk about, the horizontal approach. You can use it in elderly patients, women, uh, patients with uh, CCS plus 1 to 3, previous MI, cerebrovascular accident, PCI, diabetes, asthma, peripheral vascular disease. And those are the big ones, which, for example, asthma, you cannot use a beta blocker. That's why you have a molecule which is safe to be used on those things. And because of this, the position of the uh, basically 2019 CCS guidelines have changed based on what I have told you. Uh, and I think this is a repetition to what we have said. And finally, we're going to come to the, uh, the next two minutes. I'll be talking about the diamond approach. This is the classical view of chronic uh, of coronary syndromes. I think Musa has talked to you about it. We were talking about uh, coronary syndromes as a, a basically segmental narrowing, but this is the modern view is that we are looking at the whole vascular and endothelial tree. This is the diamond approach according to the pathophysiology. The diamond approach is actually where is my patient approach. It's the same idea. So what we are doing right now is that, let me talk you to those uh, three and examples so that you understand what's all about the diamond approach. For example, you have a patient with heart failure and he has having chronic stable angina. So basically in, a, in patients with heart failure, obviously you cannot use basically dihydropyridines or verapamil or deltiazim. So those are the no-nos or contraindicated or if you can use them, you have to use them with caution. Then, the co uh, you can use the preferred ones are beta blockers and evabradine because again, we said that in heart failure, you want to reduce the heart rate. And then you can use basically trimetazine and nitros and uh, ranulazine. Why? Because they don't affect uh, blood pressure. So you can use them safely in those patients. Usually they have low BP. So patients with uh, LV systolic dysfunction, heart failure, you can use beta blockers. You can add alan or evabradine. And finally, you can add another drug. Another example is patients with AFib. So basically, the preferred mode here is beta blockers, verapamil, deltiazim. Um, of course, you're going to use uh, as an anti, anti anginal is trimetazine and basically ranozine. So again, those are the two ones that you can use. Uh, probably you're going to stay away from the dihydropyridines because they don't have beta blocker uh, properties. For patients who present to you with tachycardia, you probably you know, want to use beta blockers, verapamil, deltiazim, and then you can add basically uh, trimetazidine and lanolzepine. So those, this is what we talk about the uh, diamond approach. So in conclusion, many patients with chronic stable angina continue to have symptoms despite current anti-anginal therapy and revascularization. Evabradine is effective and safe uh, in all types of uh, patients with angina, whatever their age, comorbidities, early combination of evabradine with beta blockers provide further clinical benefit, bet better reduction in angina symptoms, better improvement in exercise capacity, better improvement in daily activity and quality of life, 
trimetazidine in newly diagnosed angina patients or angina diabetic patients acts directly at the cardiac cell level through increasing ATP and reducing acidosis, improved cell function. Trimetazidine on top of first hemodynamic agent provides fast sustained anti-angina efficacy and significant increase in the exercise capacity. And with that, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wassam uh, Bulbanad, for the very nice, uh, uh, elegant prese presentation going over all of the management of angina with the medication of Vivabedrine and Trimizidine. So we ask you kindly to stay with us till the end. Our ladies and gentlemen, you can type your questions in the QA. The questions are coming to me. We have a lot of questions after into after a second speaker, Dr. Khaldun, we'll have uh, 20 minutes of discussion. So uh, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce our last speaker, uh, Dr. Khaldun El uh, Hamoud uh, from Chest Disease Hospital. And he will talk about us in um, current news and update management in, uh, in, sorry, in current update management for heart failure patient and in practice. So Khaldun would like to welcome you in the Heart Master program, and I will leave the microphone for yours to introduce your talk. Oh God. Uh, I was talking to myself. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Musa. I'd like to thank Survey, thank all the organizers for this um, amazing opportunity. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, salatu salam ar-Rasulullah, Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana, anna kanta al-alimu al-hakim. Allahumma alimna ma'anfa'na, wa anfa'na bi ma'allamtana. So we will start with um, um, talking about the, the, the guidelines in 2021, and new things are, um, are afoot in, in the field of heart failure. Um, lovely introductions. I got lots of, um, they helped me a lot, actually, the notes that Dr. Musa and Dr. Um, uh, Bassam presented really is going to help me through uh, smooth uh, this talk. Uh, I'm not going to go through a lot in details in heart failure. We're going to go right into the case uh, and what's new in the field. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Dr. Khaldun Lehmoud. I'm a heart failure cardiology consultant. I'm the director of the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplantation in Chest Disease Hospital. Uh, um, and um, without further ado, uh, let's continue. Now, okay. So we had in 2021 lots of um, updates. We had the uh, the, the the American present the American uh, College of Cardiology presented an expert consensus, not really a guideline, but it's an update and a uh, new look on what's uh, in the evidence. Canadians, uh, the Canadian Cardiology Society presented the uh, guideline updates, and the European uh, Society uh, Cardio of Cardiology. Uh, just recently in Florence presented, they uh, ended their Congress, which I have uh, attended, and I'd like to share some information, some insights from there, as well as we're uh, anticipating um, maybe within a few months, the uh, new uh, official update on the guidelines. So it's really, really interesting. Now, we've been working previously with the last update uh, uh, guideline of 2016, which is the um, um, has been has been uh, pr uh, presented in the guidelines, and we have noticed the the horizontal the, the vertical approach that you get those patients with symptomatic, you give them AC inhibitors and beta blockers, and um, then you watch them. Maybe you can add MRI, and then you give them a chance. You look at them. Well, you say where well, they did not tolerate ACE or ARB although ACE is on top, and then, well, I might consider ARNI as a replacement, uh, look at their heart rate, whether I can, you know, their QRS complexes, their sinus, maybe I can go for a CRT or a class uh, 2A, a Vibradin. And we went into that, and we've been doing that since then. But the evidence has been growing that we had lots of benefit that come early on when starting those medications and the diversion started really early. So why not rethink our uh, approach that 2021 update on the ACC came to bring this into perspective. And when they, they, they turned from the vertical into a more horizontal approach, we look at those patients, they gave Arnie and they said Arnie preferred uh, 
Uh, and then this hasn't been seen. We knew that this day is going to come at some point. So they started with with uh, with beta blo- evidence based beta blocker and diuretic as in as needed because some patients might not need it. And then they introduced all the other add on therapies such as uh, aldosterone uh, antagonist, the MRAs, the SGL- SGLT2 inhibitor as an add, and then uh, the um, hydralazine nitrate for a specific group, especially. Uh, symptomatic black, persistently mm-hmm. symptomatic black, and you can add on ivibradin for those indicated with uh, sinus rhythm, heart rate more than 70, despite maximum tolerable beta blockers. And you notice that diuretic is a tight, it's not an ad, it's titrate, so it's used only uh, if there uh, if there's a volume overload uh, present. Now, we, when we go to the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, published just recently this year, the um, their guidelines, and we see that the recommendation goes with the same uh, theme of starting with ARNI brackets or ACE ARB. So ARNI is the first choice. Beta blockers, MRA, SGLT2 inhibitors, all four together, and we recommend that the, uh, in the absence of contraindication, patients with HFREF be treated with combination therapy, included uh, one evidence-based medication of each of the following uh, categories. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this is a nice slide. I would really advise people to take a print screen or a screenshot on this one. Uh, this uh, uh, they and the uh, a and the Canadian uh, Cardiology Society they presented a nice uh, table. Everyone sometimes tend to fumble around looking for what are the starting doses and what are the maximum dose you have to reach. So we always have to, uh, a very good approach is telling your patients from the start, what is the maximum dose? What is the actual dose? So when you want to treat a patient, you tell them that uh, um, the Entresto is a 200 milligram medication. I'm going to start with a 50. You tell them that uh, Carvedil, uh, like um, Carvedil is a 25 milligrams. I'm going to start with 3.125. To, uh, 3.125. Uh, you know, bisoprolol is, is a 10 milligram. I'm going to give you one now. So it's very, very uh, useful to keep in um, mind that you give your patients really the uh, future perspective of the maximum dose there are and what your target is. Um, now, moving uh, to uh, the uh, Congress that was recently held, uh, well, it was supposed to be in uh, Florence, Italy. And when, when you go there, uh, when you, if those who attended would, would realize that everyone, the whole chorus was, was singing in unison regarding quadruple therapy, early initiation, new agents, and patient profiling. This is the, the actual theme uh, of the uh, conference. So many other things, of course, were there, but this is what we I really find interesting. So I'm going to take you with me. I thought to make it more interesting is take you all into a journey and look at what has been uh, said there uh, all together. So I have selected slides uh, that I've chosen. This one is talking about the drug uh, recommendation for all patients with HFREF. And uh, it's still, ACE is recommended on patients with heart failure, the reduced ejection fraction, beta blocker, uh, because of course, ACE hasn't fell off uh, the recommend. It's always there and it's always going to be there. Beta blocker as well, MRA. And then they add the, this time the paglifloxin or empegliflozin, because previously empegliflozin was only available in the 2016. Now we had DAPA with EMPA as recommended, and it got a 1A. It even actually surpassed um, uh, by evidence, the the uh, I mean by the level because we have only one randomized control trial uh, that doesn't undermine the uh, benefits of um, uh, beta blocker. But when they added one and they added one A for hosp- hospitalization and death, uh, then we look at other drugs. They have introduced the. Uh, IF channel inhibitor, evaporidin should be considered in uh, symptomatic patients with low EF, 25%, in sinus rhythm, and a resting heart rate of more than 70, despite treatment of evidence-based doses of beta blocker or maximum tolerable doses that's based on their blood pressure uh, and ACE or, and a- or ARNI and in MRI to reduce the risk of hospitalization and death as well. Uh, Ivibradin should be considered in symptomatic patients less than 25-35% uh, who are unable to tolerate 
or have contraindications. So this is talking about as a substitution, but this was, of course, uh, backed up with an expert opinion. And then uh, there were a little talk about the uh, SGC uh, stimulators, uh, the soluble gu uh, guanolin uh, cycle. A cyclase receptor, the very SIGWAT, may be considered in patients with NYHA 2 to 3, uh, 2 to 4, who have worsening heart failure despite treatment with ACE and or RNA, uh, sorry, or RNA beta blocker MRA to reduce the mortality and hospitalization. I'm going to touch on that in a while. So uh, besides that, uh, the um, currently until that until this time, OM or uh, on Captain McCarble is not licensed to be used in heart failure. However, in the future, it may be able to be considered uh, in, as an additional uh, therapy for hef uh, to treat uh, mortality and hospitalization. Uh, just a little review, I mean, for those who are not aware about the uh, Verisigwat and uh, on Captain McCarble, um, Verisigwat has been... Um, you know, identify has been there for a while. Actually, it's like since early 2013, but it's been gaining interest. We we know Rio Sigwat with of the same group that we use in pulmonary hypertension group one and four. Uh, but uh, the very Sigwat is another uh, molecule that's that stimulates uh, SGC and simply, you know, just to make it simple, with all the oxidative effects and decreased nitric oxide and the feeling dysfunction caused caused by that. Increasing cyclase actually uh, promotes uh, better uh, nitric oxide uh, availability, and it has effect of reducing myocardial stiffness, reducing thickness, ventricular remodeling, reducing fibrosis, and on the vascular bed, it reduces arterial constriction and and uh, uh, vascular stiffness. So there is there is some uh, you know hopeful uh, evidence. It's not really. Um, a magic drug, to be to be honest, it has um, it had its limitation. Uh, it should be on top of a lot of medication, and it didn't uh, work as magically as. But it's going to be uh, it's going to be there, and it's still to be considered. But we need more experience with that. Um, Captain McCarble was uh, presented through the Galactic um, HF trial, and it's a selective uh, cardiac myosin activator. So what it does actually, the problem is because it, there, the the weak binding that happened between the the myosin and the actin, uh, re, uh, the the uh, um, Captain McCarble increases the number. Of proteins that uh, of myosin that that connects to the to the actin, so it doesn't increase the oxygen consumption like other, uh, like for instance talus or these things or calcium concentration. What it does, it gives more molecules stiff, uh, st you know, holding on uh, to 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 the actin. So what happened is uh, the the McCarble increases the entire rate of myosin into the tight bounding force producing uh, state of acting like what, what they call it more hands pulling on the rope. So this is what happened. You got more hands pulling on the rope. So the pulling and the contractility improve. And by that, they aim to increase uh, duration of systole, increase systolic stroke volume. And without increase in myocyte calcium like dig digitalis, there is no um, uh, DPDT uh, max max. Uh, change. There is no increase in oxygen consumption. So it sounds good. It, you know, it's it has been there. The science has been there for a while, but it really didn't show. You know, we I, we assume that we would see like booming effect and like really improvement. But again, we found there are lots of uh, details in that trial uh, and the conclusion. That's why it didn't really reach a uh, recommendation till now. Now back to the uh, slides. In HEFPEF, we didn't have anything this meeting. Again, it's all about... Um, uh, you know, screening for the etiology and diuretics therapy for those to alleviate symptoms. When we come to uh, post-discharge patients uh, with hospitalized with acute heart failure, uh, that's quite interesting because, you know, their recommendation to uh, carefully evaluate and exclude persistent signs of congestion. So this is a thing that really it's very important. Patients really should be um, as euvolemic as possible when they leave home to prevent rehospitalization. Don't really 
be uh, tighted by the bed situation and and trying to push your patients fast because eventually they're going to come back and you don't want that to happen. Uh, it is recommended that the evidence-based uh, medication should be administered before discharge. So, you know, it's better, it's the best to put the patient on little tiny doses of everything before he goes home and up titrates uh, gradually. Uh, the early follow-up visits is one to two weeks after discharge. So do not discharge a heart failure patient and tell him to be seen after two months. Uh, it, she, uh, for us, I mean, when I discharge a patient, I have to see him within one to two weeks uh, from discharge. Uh, and then the, the, the addition of uh, maximize, maximizing their patients before uh, discharge if uh, with with iron supplements if they are with IV irons I'm going to go with that a little bit in the future but um, maybe in a slide or two so ferric carboxymaltose should be considered which is ferinject not the oral uh, iron because of lots of other uh, detailed considerations so the only thing that proven to work and reduce hospitalization is um, carboxymaltose. The thing is we really, really should not underestimate the value of reduced hospitalization. And I'm gonna come into that. Now uh, in the new, med so what's new in the um, guidelines? Uh, a simplified treatment algorithm for heart failure based on early administration of four major classes a slash RNA beta blocker MRA or S and SGLT2 inhibition and inhibitors. Uh, recommendation uh, for treatment of MREF, MREF has been introduced in the guidelines. Uh, classifications, new classification for uh, acute heart failure has been presented and uh, treatment algorithm based on phenotypes. The phenotype is an important thing uh, that we look at nowadays and, and really we don't, we, we really should avoid the, the uh, one size fit all um, strategy and profile our patients and treat them accordingly. Uh, this is again a nice slide and talk about the new era of hair growth management. And they say that an RNA and SGLT2 should be considered as a complementary therapy is not one or the other choice because we keep hearing this question should, what should i use first uh, which is better uh, what should, should i uh, can i use this who should go first both would go together and it's not they're not competitors they're complementary therapies and uh, the combination of these two th uh, drugs when added to beta blocker and mra provide additive uh, clinical meaningful gain in event free survival uh, an RNA and SGLT2 among, uh, along with beta blocker and MRA should now be considered as a key component for the four cornerstone of pharmacotherapy in patients with HFRF, i.e. quadruple therapy. And when I talk to patients, I always tell them that heart failure stands on four, four legs and you want to have them all on board. So they know that there is a, this is a disease with four therapies to work complementary. And, and we saw that quadruple therapy uh, has uh, uh, it had better effect uh, than um, uh, tri all triple therapy, limited therapy. And again, quadruple therapy, when we compare them uh, uh, in, in, regarding heart failure hospitalization, death uh, and then and rehospitalization, all cause mortality was better than uh, dual or uh, limited therapy. Now, uh, other other uh, presenters actually there, this I like the slide about the rapid sequence. I mean, making these things very slow uh, compared to very fast, you know, instead of putting them ACE and then give them beta blocker and then after two, three weeks, you give mineralocorticoid and then maybe you shift to a uh, RNA, and then you go to SGLT2. Well, if you could, you I mean, some patients you could start right away with either beta blocker, uh, um, uh, SGLT2, jump with an MRI as well, or you can start with mineral corticoid MRI. So it's better to put all of them very fast uh, in, in a very short time within four weeks rather than within six months uh, that has been done previously. And this will, and the, because we know that the diversion of the benefit of the curves uh, quite early. Uh, so current uh, armamentarium of heart failure therapies uh, makes possible to tailor uh, patient treatment and some clinical scenarios like hypotension, renal dysfunction, SGLT2 may be started first. 
uh, in normal or hypo hypertensive patients, uh, RNA can be started first. All efforts should be made to have uh, a rapid all four main therapies on board and up titrated as soon as possible. So you see where we're going. I mean, everybody is singing in unison. So, uh, the, but they're the, it's easy said than done. When we look at what are the challenges when it comes to maximization, why we see that doctors are not getting there. Why do I get patients after two years still on a tiny dose of everything? Well, number, number one, there, there is this inherent fear of worsened kidney function. It, it's more to meet the eye because worsening kidney function is really uh, multifactorial. It could be due to congestion. Is it? Is it? It's not always due to add, adding your ACE. Are you still giving or RNA? Are you still giving them RNA as GLT two with high? And and those patients, you advise them to be more constricted on their fluid intake. Plus, you are continuing the same dose of diuretic. So, are they dehydrated? Are they? volume overloaded? Are they getting NSAID on board or whatever? So uh, you can, uh, and, and once they get a worsening renal function, is it really significant or not? Not only every tiny increase of kidney, fun, uh, worsening of kidney function means it warrants um, uh, changes. Sometimes it's a uh, local hemodynamic of the kidney. You got to wait and see. You could just like step back with your doses, stop your diuretics, maybe. Uh, so you need to really maneuver around. So worsening heart kidney function is something that makes doctor uh, stop uh, at one point and do not proceed. Hyperkalemia. Uh, so what number one, What? how high is high? I mean, we've seen doctors afraid of a 4.8 or 4.9. They're worried that going to go into five. Um, you know, you don't give them a chance. You don't give them like advices on low potassium diet. There are new weapons to uh, counteract hyperkalemia. So maybe really doctors should really understand on, um, you know, be um, okay. We all have to be careful with hyperkalemia, but again, we need, really not need how to, to play that game. Soft blood pressure, you know, uh, those with asymptomatic uh, systolic blood pressure around 90. I mean, if they are asymptomatic, I mean, you see doctors afraid of 90s, 95s, even 100. Uh, you should not be afraid of that as long as they're asymptomatic, they're having good pulses with a heart rate of, with a systolic blood pressure above 90, you can keep the medication on. Maybe do not initiate when they're hypotensive, but if their blood pressure in, in that range and they're doing well, then uh, just wait and blood pressure eventually will come up with improved stroke volume in the future. Bradycardia, I mean, what is the limit? Uh, when do they start? Is is 70, you know, or 50, you know, 55, 60 is fine for heart failure patients. They like to be there. So uh, we see doctors really not pushing and they stop quite early in bradycardia. Once they're like 68, 69, you see they stop up titrating. Um, Cost of devices is a problem. Sometimes that's not in the hand of a doctor. A patient cannot afford, there's no reimbursement on uh, CRTs or ICDs. Well, you can't do anything about that. Then there's a problem of doctor's inertia. Uh, they're doing that, they, they, you know, they don't keep, they keep doing what they're doing and that's a problem. And because mild symptom does not equal mild disease. A patient who's asymptomatic does not mean that he doesn't have disease going. There's no such thing as a stable heart failure this is a total myth. This word does not exist. You should take that from your uh, vocabulary. There is something called compensated heart failure, but never a stable heart failure. So not having symptom does not in preclude not up titrating. So the patient knows that he has to reach to in to interest to two hundred to to bisoprolol ten, for instance. Okay, so um, it's not dependent on his symptom. It has to be there because this is where the evidence is. And the patient really needs to know that this is when he's going to get the evidence-based uh, uh, help. So mild symptoms does not equal mild disease. You keep up titrating despite the patient is NYHA1 after therapy because he came to you NYHA3, this Nick, he, next visit he comes, so grateful and thanking you for a great job done. I feel much, much better, doctor. Thank you for your medicines. But you have to tell him that that's not the end of the story. And finally, uh, patient uh, slash caregiver compliance. One of the problems that doctors are always facing a problem because the patient's not compliant or he's not 
maybe educated. I didn't want to put that. But again, uh, you know, you can't keep running after diuretic if he's getting a lot of a lot of fluid intake or high salt intake or not taking his medications as regular or playing with his medicines whenever he likes. So uh, this is really going to affect you maximizing his therapy. So the scopes of therapy, we have lots of scopes of therapy. We have devices. We help them with the drug therapy, rehabilitation, try to, uh, to address their mental health, anxiety, depression, and uh, monitor whether monitor uh, the, 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 bad, the effect of the therapies, whether the, and the side effects of the therapies. Um, and, and we really need to uh, have a good, law, a good uh, look at that because this leads us to phenotyping our patients. And this is the theme of the ESC 2021. The, getting a phenotype. So when you see a patient, you really have to have these four aspects of phenotypes. Their heart rate, beta blocker, renal function, AF or no AF. And you see that congestion has been, you know, placed outside the game. You try once you fix that, then 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 that's halas. We're done with that. So uh it comes and goes. But here, uh these are the things. So am I dealing with a hypotensive patient? Or a hype or a normotensive or a hypertensive patients. Am I dealing with an AF or a no AF? Do I need to anticoagulate? Okay, you have to ask those questions. And what kind of device can I do? I need ablation and all these uh, therapies. You have to look at his heart rate. Now, am I dealing with a bradycardia, uh, normal, you know, not so high or really high? heart rate. So where am I with those patients? Uh, what about their kidney functions and hyperkalemia? Are they there or not there? So based on that, you really need to divert and really tailor your therapy. Please, I mean, put this thing in mind. Every time you see a heart failure, you need to profile him where this pay. It's not enough to say that he's a half rough. So dealing with the profiles, let's talk about hypotensive patients. Now, this could be due to hypovolemia, reduce or holding diuretics and optimizing volume status. So patients, because he's been on 125 or 80 BD of diuretics, and then he took your advice on low salt intake and, be, and he's also on SGLT2 inhibitors and he's on uh, mineral corticoids now, he's also on RNA. So maybe you really need to cut down on diuretics by 50% and see how things go. Uh, maybe there are medicines that are you know, that reduce blood pressure, have no heart failure therapy uh, benefits like other, uh, like non-dihydroperidines, other anti, uh, dihydroperidines, sorry, or anti, um, uh, other anti-hypertensive treatments, uh, maybe prostate therapy, alpha blockers, uh, that they could maybe get away with. We see many patients with no obstructive uropathy, but they've been given omnic because they have an enlarged prostate, but they do not have obstruction. So really you need to see the necess necessity of those. Vasodilators, if there are lots of vasodilators, maybe uh, you need to cut down to maximize your medical therapy if you could. Um, we see patients on vasodilators when they don't have angina and, and they kept being on that. So we need to put the, our evidence-based therapy on that. Uh, as I said, BPH therapy, uh, carvedilol, maybe sometime it's a choice. Uh, some patients with the alpha blockade of, the blockade of that, um, maybe we want something with no alpha blockade uh, like metoprolol or uh, bisoprolol just to give you room for blood pressure. Uh, if a Braden, um, because you can't go up with your beta blocker, you need to uh, give it, give that to improve their uh, heart rate. Uh, digoxin, especially in AF patients, to target ventricular rate 60 to 80. Uh, you may even stop beta blockers. There's no really benefit in in, in uh, approved benefits in beta blocker in heart in AF uh, to be. And I'm going to go. I uh, think I have a slide to talk about that. But uh, really. Um, you need them to be, you don't need them to be less than 60 in AF. There is no benefit. Actually, there is some uh, reports on, on harm. So um, let's be gentle because you're giving them a lot of beta blocker, causing them hypotension, hypoperfusion. You want to aim for a less than 60 when you really don't need to. Uh, so Captain McCarble, what? Four minutes, please. Oh, my goodness. No, no, no. I'm I haven't started yet. So, okay, let's let's run quickly. 
so elevated blood pressure, uh, as, as elevated heart rate, we, uh, in sinus rhythm, um, we, we, and they're not targeted. You, you can use Ifibradin. In AF, uh, you target a 60 to 80, not less than 70. As we know, uh, in contrast to sinus rhythm, heart rate is not a predictor of mortality in heart and HFREF as in heart fit, as an AF, and there's no clear evidence of prognostic benefits of beta in AF and ventricular rate less than 70 associated with worst outcome. Uh, this is a quick slide I want to show you since 2020, 20, uh, 2001. Even before that, we know that elevated heart rate by itself is an independent factor of bad outcome in healthy individuals. Now, when we go to heart failure, we have proven that in the shift trial that controlling their heart rate with Ifibradin on top of uh, evidence-based medical therapy had improved quality of life and substantial reduce of healthcare. And we know that hospitalization uh, has been reduced favoring Ifibradin. The more we, the more uh, admissions, the worse the patient goes. Rehospitalization is a cause for uh, higher mortality. And plus, in the era of COVID, we want to get the patient as much as we can outside the hospital. Uh, we know that rate control with Ifibradin increase improve survival, hospitalization, quality of life, cardiac remodeling, and allow further uh, up to maximization of medical therapy. Impaired kidney function. Um, so uh, you want to know what is his base CKD? So, you know, if he's like in 200s and he's always been in 200, then after therapy, his creatinine is 200. So be it. Uh, is it is the kidney impaired due to congestion or pre-renal hypovolemia? Is there any NSAID on board? Uh, is the rise less than 30%? You have to be really judicious on that and not alarmed with any alarm. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitor um, will have a little bit of, of, of drop of GFR, so you shouldn't be alarmed. That's okay. Usually it will correct itself after a few weeks. Uh, close monitoring of RFTs should be done every one to two weeks with any change of medication, diuretics, uh, MRAs, or uh, anti-RAS therapy. You always have to religiously check their RFTs. And novel agents like Verisigwat and Captain McCarble uh, have been safe on a much lower GFR, respectively. These could be options for the future. Hyperkalemia, uh, you do not initiate with high blood pressure. You up titrate, maybe allow, allow a 5.5 or less than that. Uh, other cause of hyperkalemia, look at diet or NSAIDs. Uh, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors are safe and uh, for those with borderline uh, potassium. And then we have in the future, we, we have, I mean, this is the future, potassium binders like, like pteromere and sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. Um, are drugs that aren't going to help us in the future. They bind uh, potassium in the gut and help in maintaining potassium, allowing us, giving them more uh, RASI and uh, mineral corticoid antagonists. You're going to hear of new MR MRAs like uh, the finerenone and the asaxerenone, and but they all, again, cause hyperkalemia just as, uh, so they're not, if you hear about them, they're not out, you know, uh, hyperkalemia safe. So in summary, uh, let us agree that goal-directed medical therapy plus maximization of doses give you a better outcome for mortality, quality of life, and heart failure hospitalization. Not all size, not all size fit all. So um, you have to really uh, be so careful on phenotyping your patients, offering the best therapy for each patient. Now, best practice. Uh, is personalized ta tailored therapy with close follow-up, giving the right therapy for the right patient in the right way. The quadruple therapy, the Fantastic Four, the RASI blockade, preferably uh, uh, RNA beta blocker targeting a heart rate of less than 70. If needed, you add Ibibradin, aldosterone blockade with mineral corticoid antagonist and sodium uh, glucose counterpowder, uh, counterpowder uh, porter uh, 2 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. Then we have our add-on therapies, the hydral nitro, if still elevated uh, blood pressure despite maximum uh, therapy, you can give them ivibradin, uh, um, anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation with DOAC or vitamin K antagonist, uh, diuretics to relieve congestion if present, uh, device therapies if indicated, ICD, CRTs, mitroclip, and antiarrhythmic therapy if needed, like digoxin or imidrone. This is my last slide, and this is a more um, uh, detailed uh, 
view. So based on your therapy, uh, if you had a patient with, I mean, we, we could use this at the end uh, for discussion. Uh, it, it's a beautiful slide where we can uh, really uh, play with. You can have your patients with the different profiles and you see different profiles uh, gives different needs. You can mix and match all of these to get different profiles. And based on that profile, you tailor your therapy. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khaldun Lahmoud, for your uh, nice presentation. Now we have so many questions and we have about uh, 50 minutes for discussion. So uh, uh, I have so many, I receive a lot of questions. So let me direct the first question to Bassam, then I will ask the question to uh, Dr. Khaldun. Uh, Bassam, uh, the question to you, uh, should we prescribe uh, Evabedrine in patient with acute MI? Yep, so basically uh, you have a patient uh, <coughs> with acute myocardial infarction and uh, those patients having a, a high sympathetic surge. Now, the, the evidence here we are having is basically for chronic uh, uh, anginus, not for acute uh, ST elevation uh, MI. Um, so basically I think you have to go by the conventional therapy, beta blocker therapy, uh, and then you're going to have the uh, basically revascularization and see what's going to happen to your patient at the end of the day. Unless if your patient is having, <clears throat> for example, uh, MI plus heart failure, or he had a heart failure before. So it depends on where is your patient. Always ask this question. I think Khaldun, at the end of the day, he put that slide for you. It's the same thing for chronic uh, angina patients is that you have to know where is your patient. If it's only MI, I don't think, I mean, we have good evidence for it, but if it's MI with a previous history of heart failure, you might use it as a patient of having heart failure, but not for the acute ischemia. That's my response to it. So, so the short, <clears throat> no study in acute MI, and, uh, and, and the yet it's only in a chronic stable angina, and so in acute MI is not, studied so we, we rather than we not use it how about uh, uh, what is your recommendation for the doses of ibadrine uh, if combined with beta blocker and should we use it when heart rate first of all the combined with beta blocker the dose adjustment or titration then should we use it when heart rate goes below 70 with ibadrine top of beta blocker yeah, I think basically the, the dose that I, I usually go with is uh, 5 milligrams BD and I'll see what's going to happen. Okay, uh, that's for the chronic stable angina and see my patient, where is he going? Uh, as far as their heart rate is not reaching below 60, then I'm, I'm happy of using it. I have no problem uh, in adding the, the beta blocker, but I usually go with a 5 BD. I don't go to the 7.5 BD. The 7.5 BD, I probably use it for the heart failure population rather than uh, chronic stable angina. So 5BD with, with, with the use of beta blocker and then up titrated to the, yeah, maximum, what is the maximum 7.5BD? Seven the, seven, the maximum 7.5, yeah, BD. Okay. That's the maximum dose. All right, um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bassam. Uh, Dr. Khaldun, should we stop uh, evabedrine in case of acute or worsening heart failure? Uh, yes, now decompensated heart failure, um, do you mean, let's get the, let's put them into perspective. Uh, very sick, decompensated, hospitalized patient. They came with decompensated heart failure, volume overload. Yes, we actually, we're going to stop even their beta blockers. Sometimes we stop all their antihypertensive therapy because they're not anti-failure therapy. We stop it. It's not a drug to be given to acutely ill patients. It's a drug to be given in your clinic uh, as an outpatient, preferably, uh, do not give it for acutely ill patients. And if they are in acute decompensation, you can stop it. Evabredin can be stopped uh, abruptly without down titration. And, and the same uh, manner or the same track, can, can Evabedrine uh, uh, be prescribed in acute heart failure um, with, the, with it's not the decompensated? Very, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good LV function, reasonable in 40s and heart rate is in the tachycardia side. Can we use it still? Well, still Evabradin has been in the guidelines and they're the EF less than 35%. And uh, it has been tested even in HEFF, it didn't work. Uh, so uh, we keep it at uh, EF less than 35%. 
and uh, sinus rhythm in not in acute heart failure. Do not use and initiate ibuprofen because if you use the wrong medicine, the, the, a good medicine in the wrong setting, and then you get bad outcome, you're going to blame the medicine. It's not the fault of the medicine. It was the timing that you have used it. So keep up with your evidence-based therapy. Ibuprofen, I would prefer people to use it after they exhausted their uh, goal-directed medical therapies. Okay, so Bassam, uh, how soon after acute coronary syndrome we can start uh, trimizidine? Can we use it after acute coronary syndrome and how soon we can use it? Yeah, so okay, basically those are the second line uh, medications. Usually, I mean, the, the second line medications means that you have tried your first line. So most of the time you, you give your patients weeks to months to, to try those pills, unless if he's in the class uh, 2B indication where he has a contraindication or intolerance for beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, then you're gonna go to the uh, second liners. Uh, so usually uh, <clears throat> we talk about CCS that they, you have to go with the first line treatment. If that, if there's still the patient is symptomatic, then you go to the second line, unless if he's a class 2B indication. Yeah. So uh, uh, if, if patient uh, Khaldun develop atrial fibrillation occurs during treatment with the procolanon, do you stop the evabedrine, sorry? Yes, I do. Once I have AFib, I stop it. Um, you know, I have evidence of AFib, I stop it. If they're high low, you know, uh, you know, again, having, uh, thank you for this, because sometimes patients would like after the MI or initial, they, they went into an AFib or they had a pneumonia and they develop some AFib and go, that can happen to everybody. That doesn't mean that they have atrial fibrillation. So, I mean, the baseline, as you have said, uh, they develop atrial fibrillation clinically, you saw it on the ECG, then I stop it. Um, Evabradin is, is, is useful in, in helping me up titrating my therapies. You know, some patients, uh, I'm really having problem with their blood pressure. I need, and they're because they're quite tacky. And when I add it to beta blocker, uh, after the next visit, I see that their heart rate went down, their cardiac output and stroke volume went up. I see their blood pressure kind of rising and it helps me rise other medical therapies, not only by its independence, benefit. It also helps me in up titrating my other therapies. That's good. But unfortunately, if I develop atrial fibrillation, then you it's it. out of the game. Yes. Okay, so you stop it. Bassam, do you stop um, the evabedrine in case of a developed patient atrial fibrillation? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. See, um, I, I need your answer, please, um, because, because I have questions. questions. Okay. Yes or no, Bassam, what okay. do you think? Uh, Stop it. I'm not going to stop it. You'll stop it. So All right. You know, we, we have learned from the shift trial when they recruit the patients with the, uh, uh, with the heart failure, some of them, they do develop paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and they revert it to sinus. So the investigator have continued with the treatment if atrial fibrillation is back to sinus. However... Yes. If it's a persistent, then you stop it. And this is the and this is the question that came down at the last is can it be used in atrial fibrillation? In persistent atrial fibrillation, no. As I have said, in shift trial, some of the patients developed paroxysmal and they reverted to sinus. The investigator did not stop it and continued therapy based on the reversal of sinus rhythm. So uh, uh, wait, if 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 rever if it's reverse, you can continue with it, and if it becomes Persistent, not the reversible, then you can stop it. There's another question here: uh, Is what about Bassam uh, using trimizidrine? Uh, you mentioned in angina. What about using in, uh, in in cardiomyopathy due to the diabetes? Does the drug works uh, trimizidine in patient with cardiomyopathy uh, with the yeah, in okay. diabetic population? Can you comment on that? Basically, trimethazidine has been well known that it's good for, uh, especially, uh, especially used in diabetic patients, but for the CCS, like chronic stable angina portion, uh, not the cardiomyopathy uh, portion. So if it's CCS, chronic stable angina, I would use it. If it happened that the patient is having LV system dysfunction and chronic stable angina, then you're going to use it in a diabetic patient. You can use the, the pill, but it's used as for diabetic with chronic stable angina. 
Okay. So, you know, um, in, in, in trimizidine used by Korean study in diabetic cardiomyopathy and post-cabbage, with, the, with, the, with low ejection fraction, it showed that in, in diabetic cardiomyopathy, it increases ejection fraction. So yes, it can be used owing to its increase in, 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 in ejection fraction. Okay, another question, a patient uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, stroke to use uh, um, 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 a beta blocker um, um, or evabedrine, that's a good, if, if you have a patient with a stroke and coronary artery disease, do you use a beta blocker or, or, or evabedrine? Well, it's, it's nothing to do with yeah, the re reduction. Left, left okay. there, and how about, uh, Bassam, how about using trimizidine in patient with syndrome X? Do, would you use it in syndrome X? Patient with uh, uh, diagnosed as uh, nowadays if you want to call it Minoka or syndrome X, well, really, do you use trimizidine? Does it have any role of that? Now, we've been in the clinical practice, we've been using it, but really those patients, whatever you give them, honestly, I don't think I've seen any, uh, if, you just, if you'd like to say clinically plausible effect in them. I'm unaware of uh, specific studies on syndrome X to be, used in uh, with trimizidine. I don't know. Are you aware of anything, uh, Musa, for those patients specifically? It's, it's you know, um, they were uh, talking about the syndrome X. In fact, uh, it's a broad name. It may represent, as I have mentioned in my introductory slide, the functional causes of, um, of angina. And um, it has been a, a, a debate whether this is a good question, whether it works. Now, people think that trimizidine, that if you have a microcirculation dysfunction and ischemia with a reduction of ATB, trimizidine theoretically increases ATB and decreases the burden of ischemia. So it might work theoretically, but never tested in trials. So people can use it in what is called syndrome X, which is normal epicardial coronary, so angina with normal epicardial coronary, and, and one of the mechanisms is either a spasm or microvascular dysfunction. So in this situation, there might be um, a benefit of using this drug based on the theory of what I have said, increasing by ATP. Uh, in, in her, uh, the, the back to, uh, so in, in evabedrine, um, Khaldun uh, and Evabedrin, uh, if the patient uh, developed with heart failure, bradycardia in 50s on, on Evabedrin. So, so uh, and it's taking quadruple therapy, heart rate went up 70, you added Evabedrin, it came now in range of 50s. Now, 50s. So, what you will do? Would you stop, decrease? Uh, what is the what is the management in case of the patient reach heart rate 50s? Yeah, excellent. Uh, so we go back to the profile that we said. We profile your patient. Now, when I added, am I challenged with blood pressure because I cannot give more beta blocker because I can get that? I would get uh, Ivibradin, number one, out of the uh, equation. Now, if I cannot get it out of the equation, it's either it goes to 50 on a five milligrams or uh, it just goes up to 80 without it, and I cannot go up with my beta blockers, there is an option of a 2.5 milligrams uh, that's given in a selected group of patients. Um, you can give them 2.5 if you cannot, but if, if, if with time his blood pressure is fine and you think that you can get Ivibradin out of the picture, and um, and you can maximize their, uh, and without it, you get a heart rate less than 70, then that's it, you can stop it. But if you can't stop it or you can't add it, like five is either five is too much and uh, five is too much and no five is, again, too little. So 2.5 is an option. Okay. Now, before I have last two questions and we'll close because we want to watch the match, the final European. So, but, but some... Uh, 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 the question, and for both of you, can we give evabedrine with calcium channel blocker? Can we combine them? Bassam, do you think, can we combine yeah, yeah. evabedrine with calcium channel yeah. blocker? 
So basically, I mean, with, with calcium channel blockers, uh, you can uh, still use them. Again, especially if it's a dihydropyridine, then you don't have a problem with the rate control. Especially with verapamil or dilzium? Yeah. Now, so with, do we use them uh, with dilzium and vera, uh, verapamil? Uh, or, or stable angina with heart failure. I, I don't I don't I don't use delzium and Veram <laughs> in heart failure. <laughs> so yes, uh, but okay. theoretically, uh, theoretically, yes. You may maybe in FF patients they do, but again in FF I don't fight for heart rate. Actually, I no. like FF to be on the you know 80s to 90s now, heart rate. Yeah. Now the data, where were the data? There's somebody when we ask where the data are coming in the signify trial, signify trial, they use evabedrine in higher doses, 10 milligram, and, um, and they found that those with concomitant verapamil uh, or dilzium have excessive bradycardia. Now, one of this is they were using high doses more than the shift and beautiful trial. The average dose was very high compared to what was used in shift and beautiful, and therefore, uh, the other mechanism is that the interaction of verapamil with, with the cytochrome B34, and that makes more um, increase in the uh, 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 effectiveness or in the metabolism of proclinal and makes them in the or evabedrine in circulation and therefore exert more bradycardia. So from this trial, we have learned to be cautious of using because of these two points, the higher doses and the cytochrome B3. So be cautious to uh, not uh, be careful to use these in combination based on the data that came from Signify trial. Last question for both of you, and then I'll conclude for sure. There's a last question here. What is the most common side effects of evabedrine rather than the, and you know, what is the side other side effects of evabedrine other than bradycardia. Any other side effects of evabedrine other than bradycardia? Yeah, well, well yeah. it's come, it's come. Oh, sorry. Bassam, we'll start Bassam as a first speaker, then we'll, uh, we'll come to you. Bassam? They talk about the serum sickness uh, like uh, symptoms. I mean, that's one of the most important. But Khaldun, what is the other side effects other than bradycardia? Uh, rare, but it has been. Don't have phos phosphine uh, is, is one of the. Uh, um, address side effects, which is the you know patients seeing uh, some yellow, you know, fl flashes or or staccato movements around them. It's just, it's actually reversible. Patients could because there are IF channels in the eye as well, so um, it, it's a very mild side effect, and uh, it's actually very it's a reversible thing. So it's 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 the visual can be affected due to the position in retina, and yeah. should not be. Uh, use with patient with uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa because of this phenomena that you have described, physiotin and yellow vision and etc. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we passed the time. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, for uh, the speakers, Dr. Vassambul Benat, for a nice presentation and nice discussion, and uh, Dr. Khaldun Lahmoud, very nice presentation and discussion through this nice uh, discussion, and uh, we have more than 150 participants in this symposium. I would like to thank you all of you being patient with us, as well as would like to thank um, Servia for supporting and endorsing this uh, nice event, as well as uh, Kuwait Cardiac Society. So thank you very much for all of you, and we hope to see you in near future for another symposium in the HeartMaster uh, uh, tract or another wave of HeartMaster. So thank you very much. And now enjoy. I, I'm watching. Is England one, Bassam, for you? And uh, Italy is zero. So uh, thank you very much for everybody and looking forward for future uh, symposium together. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.